We welcome you back with us as beautiful Savior Lutheran Church and as neighboring congregations and siblings in Christ and people who are worshiping for the first time. We are so grateful that we can all be with one another together through this means. We want to let you know that we have been keeping you in prayers, um, that our hearts are there for you, and um, certainly do reach out to us if there's any way that we can provide a need for you. To those neighboring congregations, we pray that this might be a blessing for you for these few weeks or so until you are able to return to your own facilities and gather with one another in person again. Uh, as a reminder to people, please reach out to those three neighbors this week. Make a phone call, check on how people are doing, make sure that they're doing fine, and let us know as the church um, if there is some way that we can be there for people. People will know that we are Christians by our love because we have a message of love from God, the God who loved us first and loved us the best. Come, let us walk in the light of the Lord. Jesus will teach us his ways and we will walk in his paths. By truth and do not sell it. By wisdom, knowledge, and understanding. And now we'll share responsively the Decalogue the Ten Commandments. God spoke these words and said, I am the Lord your God, you shall have no other gods. Lord, have mercy upon us and incline our hearts to keep his commandment. You shall not take the name of the Lord your God in vain. Lord, have mercy upon us and incline our hearts to keep his commandment. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Lord, have mercy upon us, and incline our hearts to keep this commandment. Honor your father and mother. Lord, have mercy upon us, and incline our hearts to keep this commandment. You shall not kill. Lord, have mercy upon us, and incline our hearts to keep this commandment. You shall not commit adultery. Lord, have mercy upon us, and incline our hearts to keep this commandment. You shall not steal. Lord, have mercy upon us, and incline our hearts to keep this commandment. You shall not bear false witness against your neighbor. Lord, have mercy upon us, and incline our hearts to keep this commandment. You shall not covet your neighbor's house. Lord, have mercy upon us, and incline our hearts to keep this commandment. You shall not covet anything else that belongs to your neighbor. Lord, have mercy upon us and incline our hearts to keep this commandment. Jesus summarized the Decalogue into two great commandments. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. This is the great and first commandment. And the second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments depend all the law and the prophets. The statutes of the Lord are just and rejoice the heart. The commandment of the Lord is clear and gives light to our eyes.
grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. And also with you. Let us pray. Almighty God, your Son came into the world to free us all from sin and death. Breathe upon us the power of your Spirit, that we may be raised to new life in Christ and serve you in righteousness all our days. Through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Although as individuals we are unique in many and various ways, we gather as a congregation for a common mission. In Jesus' name, we bring glory to God through fulfilling worship, serve God's people both within our congregation and without, learn about the Lord's will for us through sharing and teaching, and connect within our membership and reach out to connect with others. shows us 
the power, the transformative power of what happens when someone stands beneath the cross of Christ. It was at that moment when Jesus died that the centurion could say, truly, this man was God's son. Good morning. Our lesson is found in Isaiah chapter 49, verses 1 through 6. Listen to me, O coastlands. Pay attention, you peoples from far away. The Lord called me before I was born. While I was in my mother's womb, he named me. He made my mouth like a sharp sword. In the shadow of his hand, he hid me. He made me a polished arrow. In his quiver, he hid me away. And he said to me, You are my servant, Israel, in whom I will be glorified. But I said, I have labored in vain. I have spent my strength for nothing and vanity. Yet surely my cause is with the Lord, and my reward is with my God. And now the Lord says, Who formed me in the womb to be his servant, to bring Jacob back to him, and that Israel might be gathered to him. For I am honored in the sight of the Lord, and my God has become my strength. He says, It is too light a thing that you should be my servant to raise up the tribes of Jacob and to restore the survivors of Israel. I will give you as a light to the nations, that my salvation may reach to the end of the earth. The Word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Can you wave again? Our Bible story today is about a centurion that was at the cross. And seeing Jesus and, and witnessing what happened, the centurion said, surely this is the Son of God. Do you know what it means to be the Son of God? Mm. No? No, it's kind of hard to think about what does being the Son of God mean? Well, we might think of it in some other ways. And I have a little song because... We can think of Jesus as the Son of God, but it means that God, Jesus is really important, and God, Jesus is part of our life, and, and Jesus is over a lot of the world and takes care of us. So, and there's lots of other ways and other words in the Bible that help us to remember who Jesus is. So we're going to sing a little song. Sorry. This song will come back later on. So if you all at home want to learn it and practice singing it this week and get used to singing it, and maybe it could be just a fun thing to sing. Um, we'll sing it again, probably, I think, at the end of April. So it goes like this. He's my rock, my sword, my shield. He's the hole in the middle of the wheel. He's my lily of the valley. He's my bright and shining star. Makes no difference what you say. I'll get on my knees and pray. I'll get down till the day my Jesus comes. Yeehaw! You want to try it again? So they can all sing it with us the second time at home, all right? So if you're sitting and watching, stand up and you can do the motions and get a little bit of movement into it. 
today. Let's try it again. Ready? He's my rock, my sword, my shield. He's the hole in the middle of the wheel. He's my lily of the valley. He's my bright and shining star. Makes no difference what you say. I'll get on my knees and pray. I'll get down till the day my Jesus comes. Yeehaw! Let's pray. Dear God, thank you that Jesus is our everything and that Jesus is your son. And we know that means we can always trust in him. Amen. As a reminder, today's sermon is about the centurion, one of the faces at the cross of Jesus. And today's sermon is a first-person narrative um, to gain a better understanding of what his perspective might have been. I really didn't expect anything new when I awoke that Friday morning. You know, just going about a normal day's work, maybe I'd have some criminals that I'd have to crucify like usual. Uh, but, you know, that's one of the things we did as Roman soldiers. And me as a centurion who was in charge of a hundred of them, it was just commonplace stuff. You know, driving nails into a person's wrists, fastening them to the cross, in a strange way it became second nature to us. You know, this day we didn't know for sure all of the people that we were going to crucify. Um, we did know that there were going to be a couple of common thieves, some bandits who would often rob pilgrims um, on the way to the, um, to the holy sites. Um, but there was a third one that we were still holding out on. See, there was this political game that was going back and forth between our governor, Pontius Pilate, um, and the religious leaders of the local people. Uh, Pilate really wanted to execute this political prisoner by the name of Barabbas, uh, but the religious leaders wanted to have this Jesus of Nazareth crucified. Uh, now, we did know about this Jesus of Nazareth. It's not that we had not heard about him before. In fact, a lot of people heard about Jesus. A lot of people had opinions about Jesus. I mean, especially at first when his popularity was growing, you know, as, as Romans, we, we, were, we had conquered this land and we had to send in some spies and just kind of listen in and make sure this guy wasn't going to start another revolt, you know? It's a thing a normal government needs to do. Um, but when we investigated him, we realized that this Jesus of Nazareth, he was not going to be a political threat to the Roman Empire. Um, in fact, to the contrary, Jesus told his followers to love their enemies. And, you know, hey, loving us Romans instead of fighting us worked out just fine for us. I mean, we thought, hey, hey, Jesus of Nazareth, keep telling people to love. That's just going to make our job of occupying your country that much easier. So we knew about him. Uh, but after all of the debates, Pilate gave in to the religious leader's demands. I mean, after all, for him, eh, just one more person to crucify. It didn't really matter that much to him. And so then it was our job to crucify these two thieves and this religious zealot by the name of Jesus of Nazareth. It would actually be a kind of easy day's worth of work, only, a, you know, three crucifixions. And it's what we were paid to do. Um, however, <laughs> and the big however is this, I had no idea, really, how the day would change me. See, what I saw and what I heard that day changed my life forever. What I saw Jesus endure and the things that he said it changed my life Jerusalem was crowded that day there were tens of thousands of people who had gathered for the observance of the Jewish Passover the celebration when um, they were celebrating being freed um, as slaves from Egypt and of course we had to be a little bit more on our guard because it's a it was a very um, uh, proud day of celebrating that somebody who had conquered them uh, no longer did so. And of course, as the Romans who were conquering them at the time, uh, we, we needed to be you know, a little extra cautious. But generally, we had done this before. It happens every year. And, you know, quite frankly, I really didn't get into the whole religious stuff. I wasn't a really religious person. I actually kind of thought religion was for weak-minded people, um, kind of like 
<clears throat> these people that we had conquered. But everybody on the, on the street again, they, they all were talking about this Jesus guy. Um, they had opinions about him, and so I realized we still needed to be a little bit alert to that. Um, you wouldn't want some of his followers to do something, you know, ridiculous, like try to rescue him, or you didn't want some of his opponents to try to execute him or take him out or assassinate him. I mean, that was our job to do as the Romans. We were the law and order. Well, eventually it came to the third hour of the day. Uh, that's 9 o'clock your time, the way you count it. And, and then I instructed my soldiers to carry out uh, the governor's Pontius Pilate's orders to crucify Jesus and the other criminals. And I got to admit, when I first saw Jesus, I was taken a little bit off guard. Um, I had, cannot forget to this day the look in his eyes um, I, as he looked out to people. He had kindness and compassion and love and even forgiveness as people were being so cruel to him. You know, my my soldiers led him then with this cross beam over his shoulders um, towards the garbage dump named Golgotha outside the city where we had the criminals executed and <clears throat> and he was utterly exhausted. I mean the things that um, had been done to him from the scourging and the whipping was just just horrendous. There was no way he was going to get that cross beam there all by himself. Um, now yes on top of it some of our soldiers had some more fun at his expense. One twisted a crown of thorns, put it on his head, and, and drove it into it by hitting him uh, with a beam. Um, but after long, as we were walking the way, Jesus collapsed <coughs> underneath the weight of this cross. So my soldiers, um, they went out, they got this Simon of Cyrene guy to help him carry the beam. And um, now, now don't misunderstand me. It, it's not like I was being compassionate or feeling sorry for this Jesus. Uh, we had a job to do. We had to get on with our work, and, you know, there's timetables and everything. Uh, <clears throat> so we just had to get our job done. So the closer we got to that garbage dump, Golgotha, um, we actually noticed the crowd was getting a bit larger. Um, people were lining the streets to see this Jesus who was being led up the way. Of course, we did even more scanning of the crowd. We wanted to make sure nobody was going to do anything foolish. But we finally got to the top of the hill. And when we got there, we did what we were trained to do. Our soldiers drove the steel spikes through the wrists and through the, the, through the ankles and um, put them up on the crosses, pushed up the crosses, and then had it just drop heavily right into the holes that were there for them. And then this is the part of the job that got, well, kind of boring, to be honest. You have to just sit there and watch and wait. Uh, you know, we gambled over his clothing. Um, there was really nothing to do other than to make sure nobody did anything ridiculous and ran up to the cross. Uh, we saw people around, all sorts of people crying, but we really just did the boring part of waiting and watching. There were these two thieves next to Jesus, though, and they were acting a little bit different. They were angry. They were cursing at people. At least one was until he had this conversation with Jesus up there about paradise, and then he really changed after that. But that was really kind of the only entertainment we had was these people yelling and screaming and mocking back and forth. But then there was Jesus this man, this rabbi, this teacher who had love and compassion in his eyes. I started to think, what's different about this person? Why is he acting so different than the rest? But of course I had a job to do, so I couldn't allow myself to get caught up too much in that kind of thinking. But then as the day went on, I started to get more uneasy, just wondering how this man could have such care and compassion for people who were treating him so terribly, so awfully. I mean, he hung there on that cross, stripped of all of his clothing, all of his dignity, insects landing on him and landing on his wounds and his cuts. He was obviously in excruciating pain, and yet he was so at peace with the situation. Even the crowd, though they kept ridiculing and insulting him, he just was at peace 
and he was compassionate. He responded in a way that I've never seen before from a crucified person. He said, Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they are doing. I looked around to see if he was speaking to his father, but I, I saw a mother there who was crying but, and a bunch of other women and, and one guy uh, named John, but I, I didn't see a father. But he said, Father, forgive them. And I thought to myself, who is this person and how can he be so strong? And quite frankly, I'm in the Roman military. How can I get some of that strength for myself? My respect for this Jesus of Nazareth was growing quite a bit. Even while he died, he had concern for others. He was promising people a better tomorrow. What kind of person does that when their life is being taken away from them? You know, I didn't become a centurion because I'm a bad judge of character. I, I kind of read people pretty well and I have to say, this was not normal behavior for a crucified person. The hours continued to pass. It was eventually the sixth hour, that's 12 noon your time. <clears throat> and then there was an eclipse. The sun went out. It went dark in the sky. We had to be a little bit more on guard because we thought this could be a time for some desperate rescue attempt. But really... We could kind of tell with this Jesus, at least, nothing like that was going to happen. For some reason, we didn't really have to worry about somebody trying to rescue him. I somehow had a feeling that Jesus of Nazareth wasn't trying to escape. In fact, it seemed like he was right where he was supposed to be. More hours passed, and then it was the ninth hour. That's 3 p.m. your time. And Jesus looked up to the sky through his swollen and puffy eyes as best as possible. And I watched his eyes. And as he was searching up through the heavens, it was almost like a child who had been lost in a crowd searching for their parents. This really began to melt my heart a bit, although I couldn't show it because, you know, I had a kid of my own and I could just imagine what this would be like. Not once did Jesus make a demand or curse at anybody. Not once did he look like he hated people. And then he did something else that totally surprised me. He shouted out a cry of triumph. I've been through many battles in the Roman military. I know what it sounds like when the Roman trumpet blasts that the battle has been won. It's what it sounded like when he said, it is finished. And I thought to myself, what do you mean? You know, what's finished? I mean, his life maybe, he was about to die, but, but was it something more? It actually sounded more like, it is accomplished. It is achieved. It is fulfilled. The goal is done. I knew that sound of victory from the Roman military. But never, ever had I heard a person hanging on a cross shout with a cry of triumph like that. But then again, as I said, I had never encountered somebody like this Jesus of Nazareth before. The last words he spoke were to his father. He said, Father, into your hands I commend my spirit. And then he died. In a way, strangely, peacefully, although on a Roman cross. He died peacefully, like a child falling asleep in the arms of a loving parent. I was standing at the foot of that cross, and somehow I knew I was in the presence of something greater than myself. I was in the presence of something that could never admit it because it would be treason, but even greater than the Roman Empire. I was standing in the presence of the living God. I somehow knew that Jesus was up there for me and for you and for every person 
who would ever live, including the people who put him up there. It was that moment, and I don't know where it came from, that I just had to shout out that truly this was God's son. We took him off that cross, and some of his followers put him over in a tomb. There was a sort of well-known, wealthy person in the area who had a tomb that he had prepared for himself, and so they used that for, for Jesus instead. The religious leaders convinced the governor to post a few of our guards at the tomb just to be safe, um, you know, because they had heard Jesus saying something about that he'd come back from the dead. Um, and the leaders, of course, didn't want anything like that to seem to happen. So we put some of our absolutely best trained soldiers to stand guard over the tomb. And of course, in the Roman military, the punishment for fleeing a, a guard post is immediate death. Well, it was pretty uneventful until that early Sunday morning when my soldiers reported appearing, reported appearing to see two angels in white robes, and they were so frightened that they fainted, which again, after the things we've seen in the military, and especially the Roman military, we don't faint. When they awoke, they saw that this stone that sealed the tomb, this stone that took many soldiers to roll into place, had now been rolled away, and the tomb was empty. They became terrified. They went and reported it to the chief priests. The chief priests paid them to keep their mouths shut and actually to claim, oh, Jesus' followers snuck over and took the body, which again, how many soldiers did it take to roll that stone into place in the first place? It would only take divine power to move it back, which is what appears to have happened. No Roman soldier would willingly admit, though, what the chief priests were saying because it was all punishable by death. We knew better. We knew something more had happened. During that next 40 days, more and more people claimed to see Jesus alive. And it really just enforced what I had already come to know and to believe. Because as I stood there, as one of those faces beneath the cross of Jesus, I came to know that this Jesus of Nazareth truly was and truly is the Son of the living God. Amen. <laughs>
God's own people through our baptism into Christ, living together in trust and hope, we confess our faith. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord. He was conceived by the power of the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. On the third day he rose again. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and a life everlasting. Amen. Turning our hearts to God, who is gracious and merciful, we pray for the church, the world, and all who are in need. God of life, bind your faithful people into one body. Enliven the church with your spirit and bless the work of those who work for its renewal, like Hans Nielsen Hauge, whom we commemorate today. Accomplish your work of salvation in us and through us for the sake of the world. Hear us, O God. Your mercy is great. God of life, you love the world you have made and you grieve when creation suffers. Restore polluted lands and waterways. Heal areas of the world ravaged by storms, floods, wildfires, droughts, or other natural disasters. And especially we pray for all those suffering as a result of the current virus. Bring all things to new life. Hear us, O God. Your mercy is great. God of life, show redemption to all who watch and wait with eager expectation. Those longing for wars to cease, those waiting for immigration paperwork to finalize, those seeking election, and those in dire need of humanitarian relief. Come quickly with your hope. Hear us, O God. Your mercy is great. God of life, you weep with those who grieve. Unbind all who are held captive by anxiety, despair, or pain, especially those suffering as a result of the current virus and all others whom we lift up now with our hearts and voices. Fill us with compassion and empathy for those who struggle and keep us faithful in prayer. Hear us, O oh God. Your mercy is great. God of life, we give thanks for opportunities for this congregation to collaborate with our community in caring for the needs of our neighbors. We especially give you thanks for the way that we can all virtually worship with one another on this day. Strengthen our ties with one another, with other congregations and agencies and services. Hear us, O oh God. Your mercy is great. God of life, you are our resurrection. We remember all those who have died and trust that in you they will live again, especially those for whom we give thanks now. Breathe new life into our dry bones that we too might live with you forever. Hear us, O oh God. Your mercy is great. Lord, remember us in your kingdom and teach us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Today's stewardship reading is from Paul's second letter to the Corinthians, chapter 8, verses 1 through 2. Paul wrote, We want you to know, brothers and sisters, about the grace of God that has been granted to the churches of Macedonia. For during a severe ordeal of affliction, their abundant joy and their extreme poverty have overflowed in a wealth of generosity on their part. 
It has been a true blessing over the last week or so to hear stories of people finding ways to help their neighbors by calling them, by supporting them, by dropping things at their door to make sure that needs are met. Even though we are dealing with an affliction as a society right now because of this virus, Paul reminds us it is actually the great time to reach out with abundant joy and to love <clears throat> and to give. And so we invite you to worship God with your tithes and offerings at this time by going to bslcmi.org. That's our church's website, bslcmi.org, where you can click on a giving button and either give once or, go, uh, or begin to give in an automated fashion. It's also possible to send in gifts to the church address, which is listed on the screen right now. All of these gifts help support us, but more importantly, help support the work we are doing as we are reaching out to help others during this time of great affliction. Little did the centurion know when he awoke that morning that he would be a face-to-face -face witness of the most important moment in history. Little did he know that he would have an encounter with the God of the universe. And yet that encounter changed him. It transformed his heart and he exclaimed that he knew that Jesus was the Son of God. We too, when we stand beneath the cross of Jesus, can have those surprising encounters where our hearts are melted and transformed and changed for the better. Buy truth and do not sell it. Buy wisdom, knowledge, and understanding. Now is the acceptable time. Now is the day of salvation. Holy God, speaking, spoken, and inspiring, bless you, unbind you, and send you in love and in peace. Amen. Go in peace and serve the Lord. We will. Thanks, Thanks be to God. And next week, we'll invite someone to worship with beautiful Savior online. Amen. Amen.